Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Charles Overby, the uh, chairman of the Overby Center for Southern Journalism and Politics. I'm glad to welcome you here this afternoon uh, for a, what I know is going to be a great session of remembering our friend Larry Speaks. This is similar to programs that we have done in the past where we have remembered um, important people who were good friends of Ole Miss and of journalism here at Ole Miss. We did this for, we remembered David Halberstam, we remembered um, uh, Jack Nelson, and we remembered Doug Marlette. And today we are so uh, pleased to have the opportunity to remember Larry Speaks. Uh, joining me are three people who knew Larry in different stages of his life. Ed Meek has known him, in, at least in this group up here, the longest. You'll hear from him in a minute. Everybody knows Ed, doesn't need any introduction, but go to hottytotty.com uh, regularly if you want to know what's going on here in Oxford and around Ole Miss. Curtis Wilkie is the senior fellow at the Overby Center and knew Larry when Curtis was covering the White House. And we're sure to hear some good stories uh, that uh, uh, highlight the good relationship between Curtis and Ronald Reagan. And, and then Scott Coopwood uh, knew him later in life. Uh, and Scott uh, is a publishing uh, mogul. Uh, and his latest venture is uh, Delta Magazine. And does a great job with that, but he's got a lot of other things that he does well also. We're so pleased that uh, not only the friends of Larry Speaks would be here, but so many members of the family are here. Uh, this is not a memorial service, not designed to be that way. It's a, it's a time of remembering Larry. We'll, we'll have some laughs. Uh, we'll learn some things about uh, what I think is a great example for students, and we have, I'm so pleased to see students here today. And um, I'll tell you, if Larry can do it, any one of you can do it. He came from nothing, and he went to the top. And we're going to talk about that today. And the person who uh, is most responsible for Larry going to Washington and a lot of other things, including mischief here at Ole Miss, is Ed Meek. And I thought we'd start out uh, hearing from Ed about the improbable rise of not just Larry Speaks, but Ed Meek also. Uh, how did that uh, relationship uh, begin? And tell us about well, it. Well, first let me uh, recognize some, some dear friends, uh, Sandy and uh, Scott and Jeremy, Larry's sons and daughters, and Laura, his wife. Uh, I have deep roots with the family. Larry was by far my best friend, my mentor. And one of the things I did for him was to do a photo essay. I was a photographer of the birth of his first child at the old Bramley Hospital when Janelle climbed up in the bed and the, there was a cinder block used to get in the bed. And I did a photo essay. And then Laura came back to Mississippi and was my very capable vice president for finance for many, many years. And I've seen Scott's career go and I've eaten at the restaurant. Uh, and I went to Jeremy's wedding in, uh, on the beach in bare feet, so we have deep roots. But uh, <clears throat> Larry was, was clearly the best friend I've ever had. He was my mentor. I came from Charleston, had hardly been north of Memphis. Met Larry, who was uh, politically tied in on campus, and I hooked to his coattails right quick. <clears throat> and we seemed, soon became best of friends. And, uh, uh, the best advice I ever got from Larry one day, I was going to be a photographer, and I had had some great success in photography. And he said, Meek, you're never going to mount anything to learn how to write. I said, what do you mean? He said, you just can't do anything unless you can write, too. Well, I didn't want to write. But then I got into Dr. Hort's class, and I learned Larry was right. And Dr. Hort taught me how to write, but Larry did also. <clears throat> we were working in the Lyceum. We were provided offices in the Lyceum. We had a teletype, had a UPI transmitter. Uh, I had to take a cut and pay when I took my full-time job at Ole Miss because Larry and I wrote for three different media. He wrote for the Commercial Appeal, the State Times, and AP. We would write the same story three times, send in three pictures, get paid three times. 
I wrote for the Birmingham News, for the Jackson Data News, and UPI. And we were pretty well regarded even in college. So when the mayor of the crisis came along, we went, we went on the inside. We could work both sides of the fence. <clears throat> but Larry taught me so much, and I'll give you one example. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the first African American who attempted to enroll at Ole Miss was named Clement Kings. Clement King came in the front door of the Lyceum, and this was all prearranged, where uh, he was ushered out the side door, and mysteriously a bottle of hooch whiskey was found on the front seat of his car. He was taken off to Whitfield. Larry and I were in the dark room when that came by. We saw the whole story. We were excited to break this story, ran upstairs, <clears throat> and Mr. Hugh Clegg, who looked like Nikita Khrushchev, literally, and who was, uh, is, in my mind, about as scary, uh, called us and said, boys, I want to talk to you all a minute. So we walk in, we had the stories written. <clears throat> Mr. Clegg was the most powerful, scary person I knew in my life. And I'm sitting there, he says, I want to tell you all what's going on. So he shuts the door, and I'm making notes like crazy, and Larry's just sitting there. And I thought, well, Larry's not making notes. As we walked out, <clears throat> Larry said, you realize what happened? He took us off the record. Well, of course, I didn't know what that meant, really. I said, what do you mean? He said, now we can't use what worry knew. And I said, well, that old son of a bitch. Next morning, I got a call from Mr. Clegg's secretary. He said, Mr. Clegg wants to see you. Uh-oh. I went into his office shaking, scared to death. He said, shut the door. He got up, stood up, sat on his desk. He said, Mr. Meek, did you call me a son of a bitch? I said, yes, sir, Mr. Clegg, I did. I told you why. He got up from around that desk, came around and hugged me and said, you're right. I should never have done that. And I learned what off the record meant and what good journalism was from that, that experience. Now, <clears throat> Larry and I got into photo business, and we were just making money hand over fist. We had all the fraternities, sororities lined up. So I worked as a printer's devil at the Mississippi Sun, started in the sixth grade. So I went home and hand set tight and printed a business card, Speaks and Meek Photography. I was so proud. I thought Larry would be proud. Handed him a card. He said, Ed, budget, he called me. You spelled my meek, he called me. He said, you spelled my name wrong. I said, what do you mean? I spelled S-P-E-A-K-S. -E I left the E off. He never forgave me for that. But I have to say, something will never change, and Jerry Hall will prove this. When I made some comment on our internet page about Larry's passing, I misspelled Reagan, as Will Norton pointed out. And I said, well, Larry's probably laughing his panty off. Some things never change. Well, that. And uh, then, then Larry was not beyond uh, being my mentor, but uh, taking advantage of me. This happened. The only bank robbery that in my memory that ever happened in Oxford was First National Bank. I happened to be Johnny on the spot. I got the story, got the pictures, and man, I was just going, had the scoop of a lifetime. Came back to find my story. Larry didn't get it. He said, you got to share with me. So I said, okay, I'll give you some pictures. Well, <clears throat> I was working for the Birmingham News. My paper was an afternoon paper. Got it in Mississippi about 12 o'clock. I didn't think about it. I gave Larry the whole story and everything. My editor got me up out of bed about 5 o'clock next morning and said, what the hell's wrong with you? I said, what do you mean? Well, Larry put the paper, put, put my pictures and my story in the commercial appeal. It moved on the AP wire about 5 o'clock, and there Birmingham News didn't come out to 1 o'clock. And so Larry got my scoop. And when I saw him next time, he said, well, I thought you understood that. <laughs> no, I didn't. So I, I, I learned so much. But my... my Relationship with Larry was just beyond reality. I was young in my career. I got a call from one of the Hedemans who were extremely powerful in Mississippi. Here I am, a 24-year-old PR guy from Ole Miss, and Mr. Tom Hedeman called me. I wanted me to come to Jackson. Port of Fortune called me in the chance said, Mr. Tom, will see you. I said, what about you? He said, I don't know, but you go down there. I thought I'd done something wrong. I walked in his office. He said, <clears throat> Mr. Meek, I want you to pack your bags. I want you to be in Washington. Monday morning, you're going to be Jim Eastland's press secretary. I'd never been north of Memphis. I didn't want to go to Washington. Scared me to death. I came back to Dr. Porch and told him. He said, my goodness. And I said, Chester, I, I don't want to do that. My wife, we, we want to stay here. I'm, I'm just scared to death. He said, well, you better find something because if you make Mr. Hedman mad, you're not going to have this job. You better find somebody. I called Larry. Larry said, I'll take it. So Larry went to Washington, worked for uh, Senator Eastland, and the story goes from there. But I owe so much to Larry, so much. I learned so much from him. I say, he told many students, Larry Speaks could write a story about a rock in the middle of the road. 
and he could. And I developed somewhat of that facility from he and my dear friend, Professor Hoare. But it was Larry who really taught me how to get after things and a good strong work ethic. Yeah, thank you for uh, sharing those stories. I'm gonna come back to you. There's been a, two or three references to Dr. Jerry Hoare. He's here, he taught Larry. And uh, so we're so glad, uh, Dr. Hoare, that you could be here with us. And you might be able to tell us later whether any of these stories are actually true. <laughs> uh, Curtis, uh, I'd be interested in knowing when you first knew Larry, whether you knew him when you were a student here at Ole Miss, and then how, uh, whether it was a, a great advantage or just a s small advantage or no advantage at all about having the Mississippi connection when you were covering Reagan and he was the press spokesman. Sure. No, I, I was in school with uh, with Larry here. Uh, Ed and I started together, and uh, Larry was a year ahead of us, if, if I recall. And back then, Ole Miss journalism, uh, Jerry, we probably had no more than 20 students in the whole uh, getting journalism majors. Now we're in the hundreds, but uh, so we all knew each other. So I, I knew Larry uh, fairly well, and uh, then we, after... We left Ole Miss, we both wound up working as journalists in the Delta, and then we both wound up in Washington about the same time. He went to work for Senator Eastland, and um, I uh, wound up working for Eastland's antithesis, Senator Mondale from Minnesota. So, uh, uh, you know, Larry and I, you know, our politics were never on the same track, but we always got along fairly well. And uh, it's, I, I was covering the White House when Larry suddenly became, you know, uh, for all practical purposes, the press secretary. And there's nobody uh, who ever had a more exacting, fierce baptism of fire than did Larry that day in late March of uh, 1981. So tell us about that day as it relates to Larry and what you observed. Well, uh, President Reagan was shot and, and wounded by a, a would-be assassin and the press secretary, who was, uh, Larry was his deputy, was Jim Brady. And Jim was uh, hit in the head and uh, we thought mortally wounded. And um, so everyone gathered, well, uh, there were two spots to gather that day at the hospital where President Reagan was under surgery. And then uh, many of us were jammed into the, the White House press briefing room, which is not a small, uh, not a big room, probably uh, a third the size of this room, and it was suddenly jammed with people. And whose job has it become to become the voice for the White House? But Larry, and it's, it's total chaos. There are false reports on TV that Jim Brady is dead, uh, nobody really knew what the hell was going on. Nobody knew how badly hurt was President Reagan. And uh, Larry was trying to handle it as best he could, and I felt badly for him. I thought he did as good a job as anyone could. But uh, nobody really knew what was going on. And suddenly, uh, during this long afternoon, the Secretary of State was a guy named Al Haig, who's something of a mercurial character anyway came bounding out of the Situation Room in the basement of the White House and took over the podium where Larry had been trying to uh, keep us briefed as best we could. And Haig, uh, that's where he had the famous scene. I just looked it up today and watched it on YouTube. It's a great one minute or so. And everybody is yelling at Haig, who's kind of crazy anyway. And they're saying, well, who's in charge? Who's making decisions? And Haig, it's a great moment, he says, he, he gives his interpretation of the constitutional uh, order of succession, president, vice president, and me, secretary of state. Well, he conveniently left out the speaker of the house, uh, <laughs> president, the president pro, -tem. pro tem of the Senate, and, and basically then declared very loudly and dramatically, I am in charge here in the White House. And it was, it was just a lurid moment. And I'd never been exposed to Haig before. And one of the reporters from the State Department was there. And I said, this guy act like this all the time. And he said, yeah, all the time. But 
Haig then was confronted by Jim Baker, who was the chief of staff, and and he told it not in front of us. We learned this later, and told Haig, uh, you know, you're totally out of bounds here. You're not uh, in the immediate line of succession. They nearly came to blows. So that's how crazy the the scene was that day, and that was the day that Larry became. Uh, I'm not sure what his title evolved into, but out of deference to Jim Brady, who was, uh, uh, was basically incapacitated uh, uh, throughout the rest of the Reagan administration, uh, Larry never became press secretary, but he, w he was, he served in, in that position. And uh, Larry was, was popular, he was well-liked, I think, uh, I don't know of any enemies Larry had. Uh, so Curtis, let me ask you, uh, so Larry uh, is kind of elevated to the top position. Are you thinking then, boy, I've got it made. I've got a classmate here. Uh, yeah, well, did you did you take advantage of that? Yeah, well, How did that play out? Nice to think that, but of course it didn't work out that <laughs> way because I uh, worked for the Boston Globe and there was probably no paper that the Reagan administration disliked more than the liberal Boston Globe. So no, Larry never did me any favors, but he uh, he was always you know, very nice. We, we, we had a good relationship. Uh, uh, the one thing I remember, uh, uh, I was invited and went with Larry and we sat in the presidential box at Kennedy Center for a play. I'd covered four years of Jimmy Carter. They never invited me to anything like that, so uh, they didn't like me either. But uh, I was going to say bi bipartisan uh, dislike. But uh, no, Larry, uh, uh, he, you know, he didn't do do me any favors. But he 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 never you know so, rejected me or attempted to lead me astray. So if you knew Curtis when he was covering Jimmy Carter in the White House. You knew that he menaced that president with various uh, behind the scenes uh, escapades with his fellow press members. And I know that that probably carried forward to Ronald Reagan and uh, Larry Speaks. Tell us the time that uh, Larry hissed at you and your colleagues and yeah, what led to that. It wasn't my idea, but I certainly <laughs> was one of the uh, conspirators. Uh, President Reagan, uh, for all of his charm and his charisma and you know inspirational uh, bearing, was really out of it a great deal of the time. He, he, he had to rely on three by five cards. He would muddle people. So he knew he knew nobody in the press corps other than Helen Thomas and Sam Donaldson. I think he didn't have a clue who the rest of us were, and that's okay. But. You know, Carter knew who we all were, would call us by name. So Larry decided this is the way we can deal with this. At the next press conference, we'll have a seating chart. It will be in the podium in front of President <coughs> Reagan, and we'll have assigned seating in the East Room where they were going to have that particular press conference. Before that, you'd just come and sit in a room like this and sit wherever you wanted to, although the front front row center seats were always reserved for four or five people. So President Reagan is prepared to come in and he's going to call everyone by name. And we realized what they were doing. And so just before he came into the room, we all did musical chairs <laughs> and swapped. And the president screwed up just about every name. He was calling on men and there were women in the seats and he called on one guy who wasn't there and Larry was over to the side in the wings and he was hissing at us. He couldn't, couldn't hear it on the televised uh, uh, press conference but we heard him. He was hissing, you sons of bitches, see if I ever do anything for any of you again. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, if, if Larry used those words, I'd never heard Larry use any language like that at all. You never had to deal with the White House? I guess not. Well, I, <laughs> probably not. I, I've got to tell this one story, though. I, when, when Larry got in the White House, I couldn't wait to go up there 
finally got the occasion, and, and he was most generous and gracious to many, many Mississippians. I can't tell you how many calls I received from people said, Larry did this for us and so forth. So when I got there, it was just like we were back freshmen at Ole Miss. Meek this, meek that. We were just like two kids back in college. Reagan was out for something, so we go in the Oval Office. He says, go sit in the president's chair. Me, go sit in the chair. I said, I'm not going to do that. He said, no, go. I said, no, 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 no. So he takes me in the cabinet room, big, long table. He said, now, look, President Reagan sits there in the middle of the table. Go sit over there. I'll take a picture. I said, okay. So I go over there. And I look down at the, under the lip of the table. I see three white buttons. And I'm thinking, drop the bomb, launch the missile. You know, what in the world is that? I said, Larry, what's that? He said, take a look. I'll reach down and look down. He said, coffee, tea, fresca. <laughs> and uh, Larry never did forget where he came from. And never. you mentioned uh, he's taking care of Mississippi friends when they came up. Um, did, did you go back uh, more than once? Yes. And what, what was the experience? It was, it was always just like we were back freshmen at Ole Miss. We might as well have been back in the Lyceum. Uh, just two kids. We just reverted back to... Uh, what we were back then, uh, but uh, but you know he shared with me the the other occasion I went. Uh, uh, we sort of lost track of time. He said, "Wait a minute, come on! I've got, I've got a press conference out of the Rose Garden. Come on, go with me." So I walk out in the Rose Garden, <clears throat> and and Reagan and the dignitaries are up on a stage in front of me, and I can see the president's back of his head. Larry and I standing there. About that time, I saw this glove gold hand come up like that, and I said, "Who's that?" And he said, Michael Jackson. I didn't know who Michael Jackson was. But it was the day that the president recognized Michael Jackson. Of course, Larry and I had a little giggle about that. But <clears throat> our relationship uh, uh, always was more or less like we were back in working on the Mississippi and all hours of night and day and taking party pictures and doing things like that. Uh, I had the privilege of uh, knowing Larry and working with him. I was a, a reporter in Washington when he was press secretary for uh, uh, Jim Eastland. And we'd go to lunch together and laugh about things. And uh, then when he got to be a, a press spokesman for President Reagan, uh, what I liked about Larry is that he didn't, he didn't become jaded. He always uh, had just a little bit of wide-eyed wonderment about the things around him. And I remember fondly Laura and Larry and Andrew and I going to sit in the president's box at the place. And a lot of times, he told me, and Laura would know this, those boxes were empty. Just because people either uh, thought that that was beneath them or there was just uh, something that they didn't want to do. Larry tried to take uh, full advantage of an opportunity that he knew was not going to be there for a long time. Um, when uh, it came time for Larry to write his book, uh, I saw him, and it probably he'd probably been working on it about a year. And I saw him uh, out in my neighborhood. And I asked him, how's it going on the book? And he said, well, it's going pretty well. I'm just about done, but the publisher's really pushing me to put things in the book. And I said, well, that's probably how publishers are. And we kind of left it at that. And then uh, the book came out, and uh, I think people were kind of looking to try to find something. Uh, and so Larry had said, uh, and I'm going to get Curtis to comment on this, that as the press secretary, he had uh, put some words uh, out that were the president's, that, as it turned out, the president didn't actually say horror of horrors. And so that became a big, huge thing for a few days. And Larry got a lot of criticism for it. Uh, we were talking earlier. Curtis, you, might, uh, you had your own view of that, and you might just share that. Well, I just, it was something, I think, spokesman for almost anybody in Washington did all the time. I never got a, a release with a statement by some politician without thinking, you know, he never uttered it. Somebody wrote it for him and he, he authorized it. But, uh, you know, I, I, I thought, uh, you know, the criticism in, in this particular, uh, this case is just totally un unfair and unfounded. 
I, I made up quotes for four chancellors for 35 years. Oh, wait, wait a minute now. <laughs> Put it in the book. They all did. That there goes hotty toddy. Yeah, my job. <laughs> uh, I'm sure uh, Larry probably called you Ed about all that and commiserated. Uh, he did. I know. Uh, I asked him what happened, and he said, "Meek." He said, "I just they they were pressure me to get this thing done." And I just turned it over to him. I didn't even read the proof. Hmm. That's what he told me. Scott, you had the privilege of knowing Larry uh, post Washington. Talk, talk to us about how you got to know him. You're younger than the rest of us here, and so you had a different relationship problem. Well, I'm, I'm 40 years younger than Ed. I'm not <laughs> sure about y'all, but uh, no, he was a you know wonderful guy, and I, I knew who he was in high school, but I really didn't know him. It was only when Scott, his son, and I became good friends that I met him through Scott. <clears throat> on his visits uh, to the Delta, and then um, I spent a lot of time up in Washington in the late 90s and early 2000s, and he and I uh, had dinner a couple of times up there. But my, our main conversations were not about President Reagan. It was really about the Delta. And that generation had seen the civil rights, had seen integration and things that I was just a child and don't remember. So I was always real interested to hear his take on all that and what was going on. And with his newspaper background, he had a lot of stories to tell me, you know. And uh, I'll tell you one funny thing, if y'all remember uh, Charlie Capps. Do y'all remember Charlie Capps, who was later appropriations chairman uh, down in the legislature? And uh, before that, he was sheriff of Bolivar County. And Larry was working, I guess, for the Bolivar Commercial Ed, probably. And uh, we had some, there were some prisoners that escaped from the county jail and uh, had, uh, I think it was three of them, they'd end up in a cornfield or some big field where they could hide down in the crop. And so they had three or four sh uh, deputy sheriffs that went out there and kept yelling at them from their speakers to come out, come out. And uh, Larry had heard about it and he had run out there in his car and got there, was taking pictures and notes and all that. And back then, all those uh, Bolivar County uh, sheriffs carried machine guns, you know, fully automatic machine guns. So Charlie Capps said as loud as he could, he said, I'll tell you what. He said, y'all spray that field right there with your machine guns and let's see if we can find them. And the moment they lift their machine guns, all of them came out of the field with their hands <laughs> up and said, well, you know, we surrender, you know. But that was just one of many stories he told me. But he was, uh, Larry was always interested, interested in blues music and music of the Delta. And I've been a guitar player all my life. And in fact, he and I played guitars a few times. And to this day, I still use a blues lick that he taught me back in the early, not mid-90s, I guess, that I'd never learned. It was a great lick, you know. And uh, he just was a nice guy. We talked a lot about the Delta and a lot of how the Delta had changed and, um, and a lot about his life in the Delta and the Marigold Hunting Club to blues guitars to Elvis to you name it. So those were really my conversations. But I will say this. In the late 90s, I was out at the Bohemian Club in San Francisco. And I, somebody, we were probably 100 people standing around us, and somebody in the room said, where are you from in the South? Of course, you heard my accent. And I said, well, I'm from the, I always say I'm from the Mississippi Delta. I never really say I'm from Cleveland, because most people recognize the Mississippi Delta. And then he goes, oh, really? He said, uh, do you, uh, and Scott, I probably haven't told you this. I, he said, do, do you know Larry Speaks? And I said, as a matter of fact, I sure do. And about that time, two men turned around when they heard his name, walked over to me, introduced themselves to me. One was Ed Meese, former attorney general, and the other was Mike Deaver that worked at the White House, too. And they both had, particularly Meese, had a lot of complimentary things to say about Larry. But uh, he was well-respected, and we loved talking about the Delta. He loved taking pictures of the Delta and everything else. Any doubt in your mind that he never forgot where he came from? No way, huh? I, I, you know, he would, when he worked at the uh, Postal Service up in Washington, he and I would trade a lot of emails and, and I would ask him a question, or I'd send him a picture and say, look at this guitar, or look at this scene of this blues guy. And he would send me back these long emails talking about it or touching upon things like that. And he talked about when he was in the White House taking a Leland blues player up there to play Son Thomas, I think. Is that right? And uh, he said that most of the people in the White House at the time, the staff didn't realize what he was doing. They thought it was a civil rights thing. But he was just bringing a blues player up there to play for Reagan's birthday or something like that one. And uh, he said that after everybody got it, they really loved hearing Son Thomas from Leland, Mississippi play the blues in the White House. Well, just so you know that a, a man who ends up in the White House uh, can come from different beginnings. Uh, our office was located in the PR office, or information office, and the head of that was a man named Rudy Gandy. 
Well, Rudy was something of a character, and we gave him heck all the time. He couldn't t control us. Well, Larry came in one day, and <clears throat> we used to use spray glue to put the cut line onto the pictures. And you fold them up and put them in the mail. So before La uh, uh, Larry got irritated about something Rudy had done, so Rudy had a cushion in his chair that leaned back like that. So Larry goes in before Rudy comes in. Well, once they spray, he goes, shh. Rudy comes in and sits down for a while. About that time, Mr. Clegg calls. Rudy gets up and walks into Mr. Clegg's office with the cushion stuck to his rear end. <laughs> Mr. Clegg says, Rudy, you plan on staying a while? <laughs> he didn't even know he had it. <laughs> <laughs> One night, we, uh, Larry and I, during the spring, uh, had contracts for every fraternity sorority dance because he was politically tied. <clears throat> And we would go to the dance, dance close at 12 o'clock, we'd go to the dark room and work printing pictures all night, Scott. And one morning we would just tire. We'd do it on Friday night and Saturday night, and we'd take the bill by and give them the pictures and get the check before they sobered up. That was sort of the game. Well, one night we were real tired, and we were both living in the village, and we wanted to go get something to eat before we dried all the pictures. So we took about a thousand pictures into Becky's bathroom in our efficiency department of the village. <clears throat> turned them uh, face up so they would wash and left the water on to go get something to eat. We came back about an hour later and didn't wake Becky up and I, and I noticed the picture had been turned upside down. And I said, golly, what, why did Becky get up and turn them? He asked me, he said, what'd she, she get up and turn them over? I said, I don't know. We turned those pictures over three or four times and Scott, they were all gone. Something, we'd done something wrong, we don't know what. We had to go back to the dark room and print those thousand pictures again because we still don't know what we did wrong. Long way from the digital age, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'd like to go to the audience if there are any questions or observations about Larry. Uh, and as you ponder whether you're going to ask, I hope some of you will, students or friends, uh, I'd just like to ask uh, any one of you, is there any uh, lasting um, lesson that you get from uh, Larry and uh, either way he... <coughs> He acted in his professional capacity or his personal capacity. Scott, you're smiling. Well, back around late 98, 99, 2000, <clears throat> I wanted to jump in the newspaper business. I was already in the magazine business. And the Leland newspaper came up for sale. And I remember talking to Scott about it, and Larry said, there wasn't any money back then when I was doing it. There's not any money in it now. <laughs> and because of that, I passed on it, thank goodness. So I got some good advice on Good that. advice. Well, the thing that, that, that I remember really, the extraordinary, Larry was an extraordinary editor, and I mean that. He uh, was, was news editor of the Oxford Eagle, and then had his own newspaper chain. But the thing that I saw that amazed me, and this was well before the trends, he always had a little brightener on the front page. It would be two little paragraphs that were funny or something. And it made that front page. And he did it every week in every paper I ever saw. And I've sort of adopted that from Larry myself because no matter what the news is of the day, there's always a little bright spot. And Larry did that. I, I would just say that, that you all have already said it, but he never forgot where he came from. But also, he was always... Larry, you know, the guy that I knew as an undergraduate at Ole Miss and the guy who was a spokesman for the most powerful man on earth was the same guy. He never changed a bit. He uh, was never pretentious, never self-important. And as a result, uh, he, was, he was very popular among the press corps who, who covered uh, President Reagan because uh, you know, it's impossible not to like Larry. And uh, at, at one point, there was conflict within some of the uh, powerful people inside the White House, uh, and there, there were factions, as there always are. And there was an effort to move Larry aside, and they brought in a guy named Dave Gergen, who's still around. And you know, this is a guy with no ideological moorings at all. This is a guy who thinks he's the smartest uh, guy who ever came down to Pike. You know, he, this guy who worked for President Reagan, he worked for Bill Clinton. You know, how can a guy work for both people? But they brought him in, this one faction, 
and tried to muscle Larry <coughs> out of the job. And you know, Gergen could speak with great gravitas, and he was this pompous jackass, basically. And everybody much preferred to deal with Larry. Nobody liked to see Gergen when he came in to do the briefings. We all preferred to, to deal with Larry because you know he didn't blow us any bad air. Mm -hmm. Good old boy. That's good. Any uh, observations or questions from the audience? Yes. Um, for Mr. Meeks, you said you guys worked in the Lyceum. Did you guys work in it while you were at school here, or when you graduated? Yes, while we were in school, uh, we had a teletype in the, uh, when you go under, and the used to be a clock hanging in the corner there. The first office on the left was, was the information office. And because we were pretty productive, uh, we were given office desks there. Commercial Pill put in a teletype. And to my knowledge, no other college in America had a UPI transmitter for photos. And we were that productive. And we were regarded as students, I think, as professionals and certainly were paid uh, accordingly. So yes, and, and that experience of long before I graduated uh, is what made my career. No question about it. That's why I urge so many students now get experience, you've got to have it. Anybody else? Yes, sir. <clears throat> to anybody, uh, what do you think he liked and disliked most about press secretary and president? Probably having to deal with us. I mean, it's kind of like, oh, I, I wouldn't want to deal with us. Uh, <laughs> You know, a fairly rowdy, uh, uncontrollable group of people, uh, all basically smart asses by pro profession and, and asking, you know, smart ass questions and uh, nettling. You know, we did that with everybody. We did it with, 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 with it. not just Larry. Anybody would have that, have that position. Larry handled it with great equanimity. Uh, uh, you know, far more, you know, Jody Powell with, with Carter was very quick, but it was very combative and uh, adversarial proceedings uh, every day uh, with, with Jody. With, with Larry, Larry was very laid back, easy, easy to deal with, unflappable. I don't, I don't ever remember seeing Larry getting mad, uh, but, you know, it's... Uh, Except that time when you did a seating chart. That time, yeah, I'll take <laughs> well, it back. Yeah. I, I can tell you the one time that I detected that Larry was very unhappy, it was not in the White House. Larry had become vice president of Hill and Knowlton, one of the most prominent PR advertising agencies in the world. And I went up to see him, and he told me, bring, some, bring me some old Miss material. Well, we were just, we had a massive amount of really creative material. And, uh, Larry looked at that and he said, gosh, Meek, I can't believe it. He said, let me show you something. He picked up a little green color brochure that had copy on one side and the other, no graphics, no design. He said, I had to do this for Gillette, one of my accounts, and they charged $25,000 for that. He said, you did, you're doing what you, what you ought to do, stay there, I hate this job. Hmm. Some of that. You know, uh, yes, over here. Back here, yes. Oh, Joanne. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Talk about, about him coming back to Mississippi and what he did in, in your relationship with him at the end of life and some of that. Oh, uh, Scott, I can speak to this. The, the last time I saw Larry, uh, Scott called me and said, Daddy wants to come back and, and visit town and see you. And I, I had been told by Laura that uh, Larry was uh, in early stages of dementia. And as Scott will recall, Scott had a camera, and we went all over the campus in town and relived memories that he and I had. And he'd say, hey, Scott, get a picture of me and me here. We'd be standing here, standing there. And I learned later from Scott or Laura One that Larry was trying to capture memories that he didn't want to forget. And those were treasured experiences for me. Hmm. Right. Yes, over here. There was an interesting story in uh, Larry's book that hasn't been mentioned. Uh, when Larry and Janelle Robinson were seniors at Marigold High School, they went up to Memphis 
and uh, and met Elvis Presley, I think. And uh, they were trying to get up the money to take a senior trip to Washington, and so they arranged for uh, Elvis to come down to Maryland and give a concert. But between the time they made that arrangement uh, and the actual event, Elvis hit it big, and Colonel uh, Parker, or whatever his name was, wouldn't let Elvis go to Marigold. They said, we're going to send a substitute, uh, another up-and-coming singer, and wound up being Johnny Cash. <laughs> so, uh, that was uh, a pretty big deal in Marigold, I expect. Uh, one of the first time I met Larry, uh, he uh, helped my father with some press on a political campaign back in the middle 60s. That may have been his first uh, campaign. Uh, and it was later, just a year or two later, I think he went with Senator Eastman. I was working up in Washington, took off a semester in 1975, and uh, Larry invited several of us over to the White House um, for a press briefing. And I thought I was in high cotton. It was President uh, Ford, he was working for then. And I believe Ron Nesson may have been the uh, mm -hmm. press secretary. Sure. So let's see hand. Yes. Yeah, just um, any reflection after he's out of Washington on his place in history? I mean, with the communists uh, and the, the agreements, the treaties that were made there, and what he lived through, and then even to Iran Contra. Did he ever share anything with you after or about his time specifically with us? The only thing he, he uh, we had a conversation once where he talked about the experiences he had had the opportunity to be involved in, which were extraordinary, uh, being in that position that had just sort of escaped me and that he had been in the centers of, of power around the world in decision-making processes beyond my imagination. And I remember reflecting on that. Yes, sir. I can tell you right quick, he had a portfolio that would knock your socks off. And that started when we were freshmen. And all of us did. Curtis did. We all did. And that's even more important today. Good answer. In the back, Dr. Norton. Um, when I was a beginning professor here, I think, Ed, you were the one who uh, got us uh, opening into the White House. I took a about a dozen students to uh, Washington and New York, and, and Larry Speaks opened the White House press corps rooms to us for three days. He introduced the students on three different occasions to all the press corps. They were talking with Bob Schieffer and Tom Brokaw. It was an amazing experience for the students. They just couldn't get over uh, having a chance to act like they were news people. And Larry just treated them like he'd known them all their lives. I was so typical of Larry. You know, I think the thing that I most remember about Larry, uh, and, and Larry was considered a PR man, but Larry was first and foremost a journalist. There's no question about that. And, and I took that cue, and people, of course, I was called PR and I am, but, but I always tried to treat the press and act and perform as a journalist. Oh, I never lied to anybody that I know of. I might not volunteer. But Larry was that way, and uh, he considered himself a journalist. I think that's why he was effective, is he believed and understood the role of the press. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Uh, as a journalist, I'm interested in the steps or other jobs that Larry took that got him a job in the White House. Okay, I, we can all talk about that a little bit. And I wanted to mention, uh, even before you uh, ask this question, it's real easy now to look back and say, what a glamorous career Larry had. But he had some jobs uh, in Washington that were hard jobs. Being press secretary to Senator Jim Eastland may sound glamorous down here in Mississippi, 
But um, Jim Eastland didn't like the press. And so when you're the press secretary to a senator who doesn't like the press, that makes your job hard. And we would laugh about it a lot of times. But Larry persevered. And, uh, you know, there, um, Senator Eason didn't have a very good national image. But Larry had to work on that. I remember Larry telling me one time that uh, Eason, they were going to call, uh, call him right after the president had said something, some major statement. And so Eason told Larry, this is what the statement I want you to put out for me. And it was, I remember exactly what he said, what this means, if anything, remains to be seen. Now, you talk about a non-statement uh, statement. That's it. What this means, if anything, remains to be seen. So Larry did it. And then Larry was at the White House uh, uh, as a press uh, spokesman during Watergate uh, under Nixon. He was in one of the special counsel offices. That was a hard job. Any, anything involving being, working with the press during Watergate for Nixon was a tough job. But Larry was able to maintain his integrity enough to where Gerald Ford kept him, and then Ronald Reagan uh, hired him. Again, tough job. So if you go back and uh, your question, what were the jobs you had in between getting to the White House? Uh, I would say that they were many times thankless jobs, hard jobs, jobs that uh, uh, required um, just perseverance and uh, diligence uh, to get through. Uh, and because he did some of those smaller jobs very well, he was considered for the jobs in the White House. You add anything to that, Ted? Well, I just think that Larry worked hard from the first day I met him. He was doing something to make a living. We all worked our way through school, but uh, there was never a minute that we weren't practicing our craft to eat, but to grow. And uh, so when he graduated, he was well prepared, no question about it, and in, in any great demand. The people who are leaving are not leaving because they're disgusted with- uh, Me. The, yeah, maybe the moderator, but uh, the, class, the class period is up. Uh, and we're just about to finish. Uh, are there any other uh, comments from the audience or uh, questions? Uh, I'd like to um, announce that Joel Wood, who, Woods, who is a good friend of uh, the university and Ole Miss journalism, has uh, agreed to make a major contribution to fund a lecture series in the name of Larry. And uh, that will start soon. And it's a great tribute to Larry uh, from Joel. Joel is vice president of a senior vice president for government affairs of a major company in Washington. And uh, uh, Joel is another example of people who've gone to Ole Miss and done well in Washington. I'd like to thank all of you for coming, and I'd particularly like to thank our panel, Scott, Curtis, and Ed, for helping us remember Larry Speaks. Thank you very much. <laughs>